The San Diego City Council has been busy choosing a new president and sending letters to the Chargers. The city's plan to fast track affordable and sustainable housing has produced upscale single family homes. And Choice Creek has carried a toxic stew of metals and pesticides into San Diego Bay for years and may continue to do so. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer, and joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today, reporter Andrew Keats of Voice of San Diego. Hi, Andy. How you doing, Mark? Good to have you back again. Reporter James DeHaven of the San Diego Union Tribune. Hi, James. Hi, Mark. Welcome to you, and reporter Rye Rivard, also of Voice of San Diego. Hi, Rye. Hey, Mark. We're good to have you back today. Well, Democrats retained their 5-4 majority on the San Diego City Council, but it was the Republican minority who determined the new council president. And he tells about a Myrtle Cole and how was she chosen over the more liberal David Alvarez. So this is kind of a repeat of what we saw two years ago when uh, the Republican minority did the same thing to uh, supplant Todd Gloria, who was the had been the Democratic City Council president, to supplant him with Sherry Leitner. Uh, they did that same thing this time, although it was an open City Council president seat, uh, lifting Myrtle Cole into the position uh, in uh, as opposed to David Alvarez, who was more of a progressive guy and who had uh, kind of promised to sent, serve as a counterbalance to Mayor Faulkner. Yeah, so he's gone from uh, losing in that uh, special mayor election a few okay. years back to not having this shot here. Uh, just briefly, what do you think about his political fortunes? They're not going in the right direction. Well, yeah, I mean, he's got certainly two, two losses in that way. And interestingly, uh, somebody who was involved in both of those is uh, Mickey Kasparian, who's the, the leader of the local uh, labor council, who had famously selected Alvarez over Nathan Fletcher in that uh, as the Democrat in that mm -hmm. uh, mayoral tenure or mayoral run, Alvarez went on to lose, and then this time, uh, out uh, Mickey switched sides and backed Myrtle Cole. Mm -hmm. So uh, Cole did have the backing of the Labor Council and uh, UFCW. It's the you know the commercial workers, uh, the grocery store workers union. Uh, which is a very powerful uh, force in local politics. All right, give us a little bit of background. What does the council president do? Why is the job important, given that we do have a s strong mayor form of government? Yeah, so it's a couple different things. One, they, they dictate the uh, city council agenda. So if uh, large issues that you want to put <coughs> on the agenda, uh, that, that goes through the city council president. So you do actually have the opportunity to really pursue your own agenda your own uh, platform of, of major policy uh, opportunities and maybe deep six some things you you know others would want to have right right and so what we saw under Sherry Leitner was kind of more of a, a, a passive role and and using the council to put forward the mayor's agenda and kind of deferring to him as, as the person who sets the policy agenda at the city um, remains to be seen if that's in fact what Myrtle Cole will do but certainly that's what the Republican minority that voted for her and, and empowered her to get that position has in mind. Okay so I mean what's her, her track record or what direction might she take the council do we know? I mean it's you know it's kind of an open book You're, we're left to guess she has been uh, not a particularly vocal not a particularly uh, active uh, person on the City Council she has uh, been pretty happy to pursue uh, initiatives for her council district but not to be a champion for any broad citywide policies. Um, she's just not the type of person who's been up on the dais delivering thundering speeches and outlining her uh, ideological vision for what the city should be doing. That's just not who she's been so far. Again, maybe maybe she uh, comes into herself as council president, um, but so far on the city council, she has been more of a, a passive official than one who really dictates the way things are gonna be. All right, well, we do have a bite uh, from her. This is what she said about her agenda and um, Mayor Faulkner to uh, KPBS reporter Andrew Bowen. Well, right now, I want to make sure that every city council member, you know, has their issues addressed. And that's what I'm going to do, every single council member. And I'm going to work with them to make sure that, you know, if it's homelessness, if it's um, affordable housing or housing that is affordable, as people said, that's what we're going to address. Environmental issues, we're going to address everything that my city council wants to address. So that's what I'm, we're 
planning on doing? Um, a lot of the speakers today said, you know, of course it's it's important to work with the mayor and to work with all the other council members, but it's also important to push back against the mayor when you feel that, that he's not making the right decisions. Are, are you ready and willing to do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're not going to compromise our principles at all. And the mayor knows that, I believe, about me. And But we're still going to work together to make sure that this city moves forward. All right. Thanks so much. And congratulations. Or, Thank you so kind much. Of, as you said there. You can't read a lot from that, just bromides and generalities. Yeah, I mean, even before she had uh, Andrew there asking her questions, she delivered a, a speech kind of saying, uh, thanks, I'm happy to have this position. And in fact, in relatively lengthy uh, set of remarks, didn't state one specific policy that she was mm -hmm. excited to put forward. She just said, we're here to move the city forward, and then restated that sentence in eight or 10 different ways, but never once dictating a single policy. All right, well, to contrast that with the progressive side, we do have another bite here from Alvarez just before the, uh, the vote. Put simply, I've seen many missed opportunities for the council to lead and actually solve the problems that face the people of our city. In watching those missed opportunities pass us by, I have also witnessed far too often groupthink or PR stunts to pretend things are actually happening in the city. PR stunts now, what does he mean by PR stunts? Well, there's, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that the city does that are kind of just the normal course of business. And uh, if you decide that you would like to hold a press conference or a ribbon cutting to herald that normal course mm -hmm. of business, you can make it seem like you've done something really substantial, but in fact, it was kind of something that just kind of happens on its own because money comes in, it's got to go out. And mm -hmm. so I, I think that's what he's talking about there. I, I'll say, though, that within the, the fractures between Alvarez and Cole, what we started to see emerge that's pretty interesting is a, gr a, a bit of a fissure within the progressive elements in town um, that we hadn't really seen before, specifically the building trades, which is the construction laborers, threw themselves behind Alvarez, said that there's going to be some set of policies that we we are going to hold the council to. It's not going to be enough to defer to the mayor. Uh, IBW electrical workers joined them with that, and some uh, uh, well-known uh, environmentalists did as well. And then on the other side, you had the Labor Council uh, with Myrtle Cole, who was also joined by, by the mayor and the Chamber of Commerce and all of these uh, traditional conservative establishments. So that'll be you know an interesting dynamic to yeah. watch as this new council goes forward. Place. All right, I did want to turn to <clears throat> this other news from the council, which is this letter that four council members had sent to um, the Chargers saying, uh, boy, sounds like a great deal, 99 years for, for a dollar lease of that Qualcomm site and keep them here and all. First of all, this isn't really news. And yeah. what, was, what was behind this and how likely is it the Chargers are going to stay anyway? Right. I mean, <clears throat> I think what it was was one last effort to win the hearts and minds of the people to say, we're trying to do things. It's the chargers that are being uh, resistant to our offers. The, the reality is this offer has come forward many, many times over the last 15 years. Anybody who's followed this issue knew it was out there and available. The chargers most certainly knew this was a, an offer that was available. Uh, if they wanted this deal, they could have picked up the phone and called the, the city at any time. Always on the table. To happen. Yeah. So I, th I think what it was more, it was, the, the audience for this offer was not the San Diego Chargers, or even the NFL for that matter, the audience was uh, the city residents and people to kind of put the Chargers on defensive and explain why uh, getting a really valuable piece of property for one dollar for 99 years was so offensive, which is, <laughs> which what, is what they said. Un, un, unusual <laughs> for businesses to consider that sort of offer so yeah. offensive. Talking about looking gift horses. Well, let's bring our other panel members in. Uh, the yeah. Chargers is gone after this season. I mean, is this is this it? Is this a parting shot here? I have to think <clears> so. I, I haven't been here very long, but I don't see uh, many other routes. If they're resurrecting ideas that are apparently 10 years old or whatever sure. to try and keep them here. Mm -hmm. You have to think they played just about every other card they had to play. Yeah. Well, James, you, as you said, you haven't been here very long, right? What about you? Do you uh, think the Chargers are gone? Well, I want to go back <clears throat> to actually something in the Cole okay. uh, council presidency thing. Is there some rash of uh, council members not being able to pursue their own individual agendas? She indicated that in the remarks we just heard, and then several of the council members that supported her said, I want to be able to pursue my own agenda. Have they not been able to do that as council members? I mean, there are, uh, there are avenues that aren't particularly interesting, but you can use the committees that are, that are, you can, you know, you can introduce things if you are a committee chair and you can bring things through that way. There's also a, a four council member memo. So if four council members get together and sign a memo, you can bring anything you'd like without the permission of the council president. So there are still avenues. 
um, you know, that, that people can go through, and they, they do to some extent. It's a little bit harder than um, than simply if you're council president, you, you really get to con yeah, control Yeah, they just things. pick it each week as yeah. we go. All right, well, we'll see how that works out as we move into uh, January and they uh, they take their seats and take charge. Let's, uh, let's move on now. The idea was compelling, create a fast track for developers to build multiple housing units in San Diego that were both affordable and eco-friendly. But over and over again, the fast track went to luxury single family homes on the coast. Uh, James, start with uh, this program with this kind of uh, <clears throat> mouthful of a name. Yeah. <laughs> Explain the background. Well, I've, I've written it about 20 times, but I had to write it down one more time. Just to make sure <laughs> I got it right. It's the Affordable Slash Infill Housing and Sustainable Expedite Program. Ah, lovely name there. Yeah. And even the acronym is a mess. Those bureaucrats, <clears throat> poets. Yes. Yeah, they are. Yes. <laughs> but what was it? Well, how, did, how was it supposed to work? So the idea was you would pay $500 to have your permit expedited through the city's rather lengthy uh, permit review process. And that would provide you an incentive to build um, eligible projects that would be affordable housing, sustainable housing, or infill housing you know, downtown in places where they encourage that type of development. Okay, so the whole idea was you're going to get something, uh, you're going to pay this extra fee, we're going to get you through the red tape right. in a hurry, but you're going to do something for the whole community because you're going to have this uh, eco-friendly and sustainable stuff, and, and it was supposed to be multiple, you know, like four, minimum four yeah, units, Yeah, minimum right? four units. They wanted these things built fast. They still want them built, they still need it built, um, and that was part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you're, uh, this started when? Way, uh, more than a decade ago, right? Yeah, it was uh, <clears throat> 2006 was when they first started uh, rolling single family houses into the program. 2003 is when the program was enacted via council policy. All right, and we'll get to a point here in how the whole structure of the city changed in the meantime, but your, your story showed the, the program has, has failed on these specific fronts that it was supposed to promote. Uh, how so? What did the review of the uh, by the auditor? Well, like I said, in 2006, they allowed uh, single-family residential projects into the program, and that sort of squeezed out a lot of other stuff. There were other reasons why affordable homes in particular weren't getting developed, but it, it went almost, uh, the, the focus skewed a lot towards single-family. At least that's what auditors found in the audit that they put out earlier this mm -hmm. month. And uh, those single family projects obviously aren't, you know, they're less than four units. Uh, they tend to be larger, um, homes just for one family, and, and not really fulfilling the sustainability promise because you only had to do 50% renewable energy sourcing in order to qualify for the program. Okay, and, uh, and again, the four unit went out the window yeah. here, so the affordable aspect went right. out the window. Some of these homes are huge, right? 31,000 square feet was the largest one. That's a big house. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's quite large. That's a big grocery store. <laughs> yeah, that's a big grocery store. Well, Andy, you've, you've, you've reported on this as well. Uh, certain uh, architects kind of found a way around this. Who were they and how they managed that? Well, so I think one of the things that probably a smaller group of architects recognized initially is uh, in, on the coastal, in the coastal neighborhoods, there's an additional level of review. You need to get a coastal development permit, which is uh, a political decision decision making process which gives an extra layer of incentive to go through something that can make things happen faster so if you're building a single family home in uh, uptown or claremont um, you can actually get that through pretty fast you might not have that much of a reason to want to go through this on the coast that's not the case you've got this extra layer of incentive so maybe you look for something that's going to do it faster well that's exactly what happens some architects that are very active building in the coastal neighborhoods point loma la jolla Pacific Beach uh, really took advantage of this program and specifically took advantage of the fact that the city was allowing projects under the mandated threshold of four units into it in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, one in specific was uh, Tim Golba. He's a pretty prominent. Tom Golba. Yeah, yeah Tom, Tom Golba, excuse right. me. He was a pretty <laughs> prominent local architect in, uh, in, the, in the area. Not only is he a prominent architect in the area, he's on the, been on the planning commission for years. Uh, Mayor Faulkner appointed him chair of the planning commission. He's a major political donor to Mayor Faulkner. Um, he also just so happens to be the guy who at a, a city council committee hearing in 2006 um, in his role in the Sustainable Energy Advisory Board, I think I have that right, um, <clears throat> suggested to the committee, hey, maybe you'd like to consider changing this program and letting people who build single family homes into it so that we further incentivize solar powered homes. Mm -hmm. The committee 
didn't do anything with that. It was just an informational item. They didn't vote on it. The city council never voted on it. But shortly after that time, that's what the practice became. The city just started doing it, and lo and behold, the person who did it by far the most was Gold. Uh. All right, James. I mean, it's a remarkable story. No, so, so James, as we say, that was never officially approved. <clears throat> went into practice. Uh, what does the city auditor's report say about the harm done elsewhere by this expedite program? It said essentially <clears throat> that it created a logjam for other projects, both in and outside the expedite program, um, because uh, you're trying to get these things through that shouldn't even, frankly, be there. Um, and I think, I think that was the main consequence that they pointed out. I could be forgetting one. It's been a while since I've read it. I would it. say, well, so, you know, Gold, <clears throat> um, in, when I talked to him about for my story, actually pointed out, I would say, another consequence that didn't make it in the auditor's report, which is um, you had to be a local architect who was aware that the, the regulations that were written in the city's land development code were, in fact, not the regulations that were being practiced mm -hmm. by the city. So if you were an out-of-town architect or, or an mm -hmm. out-of-town developer who <clears throat> just was looking about whether this project was feasible or not. You're not going to be savvy about you're this. You're not even going to be savvy about it. You're not yeah. aware that you've got this yeah. other way that you can speed things up and make the project cheaper. Yeah. So it, it kind of built in a, a, a competitive advantage to this group of people who realized that the rules were, in fact, does. not the rules. Yes. Now, so what are they going to do about it? What's the council say and the Planning Commission if they're involved? The <laughs> Development <laughs> Services Department has stopped accepting single-family residential homes into the expedite program. Okay. Um, they decided to do that at an audit committee meeting uh, a couple Wednesdays ago, I believe, uh, basically right after these stories started coming out. Um, the council, I don't believe, has formally considered the audit or anything of that nature. So I don't think they've taken any official action on the matter. But I mean, the bottom line is DSD has decided to stop taking these projects into the program, okay, which on, is essentially on. what auditors recommended. But the do. program still exists. It's going to continue, right? Uh, yeah, as far as I know. And th did they get any affordable housing out of this at all? Because it's such a problem in this Something community? like 13%. <clears throat> So, so very low. I mean, very low. Now, in the midst of all this, we did sh change, as I alluded to, a structure of government. Uh, went mm -hmm. from weak mayor to strong mayor. We lost the city manager. Was was he? Was the city manager he or she, over the years, supposed to be watching this and didn't happen? Or yeah, I mean, sir, uh, this is the type of thing. The the change first happened three mayoral terms ago, um, and has just carried on and carried on and carried on. And now you've got a situation where the mayor's office is saying basically. Look, this didn't start under us, and mm -hmm. um, you know the situation still remains that the DSD, in a strong mayor form of government, mm -hmm. answers to the mayor's office, uh, answers to the CEOs below that, mm -hmm. and you know so there, there, there's certainly going to have to be some accountability for someone yeah. because the regulations as they exist were not being followed. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on this as it goes forward. It sounds like the change has finally been made. Well, Choice Creek meanders from La Mesa and Lemon Grove through the heart of San Diego before reaching the bay in Barrio Logan, just east of downtown. That sounds idyllic, but it's far from it. The creek is highly polluted with trash and bacteria and pesticides, and cleaning up mountains of trash is one thing, but far more difficult to deal with are the zinc and copper metals that are heading right into the Bay. So, Rice, start with the con condition of this creek. Why is it so polluted? Well, it's not a very <laughs> pretty creek. Uh, it might have been idyllic back in the day, mm -hmm. um, but it's a lot of it's concrete now. Um, and over the years, we've uh, built industries along the side of it, and we put homes along the side of it, and there's trash, like you said, in it. Um, and then there's trace amounts of metals that are coming off businesses that are near the creek and also off the interstates. You have zinc um, on your tires, coating your tires, you have zinc on metal fences, anywhere you have a metal fence, and you also have uh, copper and brake pads. So all that stuff sort of gets in the water and it's not really great for the things that are in the water. Okay, now uh, we do have uh, uh, Travis, a bite from Travis uh, Pritchard of San Diego, Coast Keepers, uh, there he's explaining how uh, the, the trash and pollution collect there, to hear that specifically. About 80% of the marine debris that we find out in the ocean actually comes from inland sources, and this is where those inland sources are. It gets washed down from our watersheds into the river, where then flows out to the ocean or the bay. All right, now these metals that we're, we're talking about, what specific harm are they doing? Um, so <clears throat> they've, uh, there's a debate about that. Um, there were some tests of sea urchin fertility back in 1999 and 2000, um, and they said some of the water in Troyes Creek was causing, if you take uh, a sea urchin sperm and a sea urchin egg and you put them together for a little bit, uh, they don't fertilize. And they blame that on most likely zinc, um, but maybe also some copper. Um, and so starting in 2008, so we're going from 2000 to 2008 because 
the wheels of government regulations turn slowly. Rather slowly, um, yeah. They decided to put a limit on the amount of metals, uh, particularly copper, particularly zinc, and also lead, although the levels of lead are mm -hmm. acceptable now, uh, to try and clean up the creek. All right, now the Regional Water Quality Control Board, they're trying to control this pollution, as, as you're talking about, mm -hmm. but you reported that it's a very complex situation. Why is that? Well, so there's a couple of things. One, uh, to get these uh, tiny bits, we're talking like microscopic bits, uh, molecules of metal out, um, you, either, uh, you either have to keep it from going in in the first place, uh, which means you <coughs> change all the ways we do brake pads, or you have to clean up the water using reverse osmosis and the sort of things that you have in a desalination plant, which are very expensive. Um, so the price tag um, for getting down to the level that the Regional Water Quality Control Board originally wanted uh, was going to be $2.1 billion. We're talking, pardon the pun, in the ballpark of a new stadium. Wow. Um, to clean this up over 20 yeah. years. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of money. That the is. bulk of that would fall to the city of San Diego because yeah. most of it flow. But but these smaller cities would have a big chunk too, right? They would, and Caltrans a little bit, the port a little bit. Okay, so um, if we're not going to to do that, I mean, the the estimates it seems you know uh, uh, you know extraordinarily high, and as you say, this isn't budgeted anywhere. Nobody's been setting aside money over yeah. time for this. Yeah, and so th now the debate becomes then, well, maybe we really don't have to do this after all, right? Yeah. Explain that. So, <laughs> <solution>. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic. So they started talking about this problem in a serious way in 1996. They did some studies in 1999. They put a limit on metals in 2008. Um, and then immediately after that, starting in 2010, uh, the city, looking at this huge price tag, was like, let's hire our own scientists and figure out if the water's really as bad as we think it is. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds sort of brazen, but actually, um, water chemistry, water science um, is not where you would hope it be would be if you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah, you reported that um, it was based on kind of some assumptions that uh, maybe were kind of shaky in the beginning. Yeah, the, the head of the <clears throat> Regional Water Quality Control Board this week uh, said that uh, the, the equation they used to calculate the metals limit was unscientific and random. Okay. And so the city said, we can do better. They paid for consultants. They said, here's our equation. And what it comes out to is we don't have to spend as much money. We only have to spend $1.2 billion instead of $2.1 billion uh, as a region. Uh, still a bunch of money. So That's a still, lot of money. And still a bunch of money. Although it's not clear that we're going to spend that much either. Right, right. Now, uh, San Diego's been successful in, in getting out from under mandates to spend billions on cleaning up the ocean and, and falls. And of course, we finally have gone to uh, sewage treatment and all, but that took a long time. I don't think people are even aware of this uh, this Choice Creek problem. There were a few stories here and there uh, when the metals limit was imposed, but since then it's sort of been radio silence, unless you're on the inside and you're freaking out and paying for a whole bunch of studies. Mm -hmm. Somebody has said, and I haven't been able to confirm this, um, but it sort of rings true in the spirit that we've spent more trying to undermine this regulation than attempting to comply with it. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe not so surprising. Now, there's been some news here here lately on all of this. They were going to have a, a vote on what to do, and they've mm -hmm. punted that off into February. Who who were the folks who stood up, and, and made, what were their arguments? Uh, so Marco Gonzalez, who's a local environmental attorney, um, who uh, files lawsuits against some of the people that are polluting mm -hmm. Choice Creek, or alleged to be polluting Choice Creek. Um, uh, said supporter with uh, Donna Fry, former city council member. And, there you go. Right. Um, and he said, "Look, if you're going to relax the standards um, for the metals limits, that's also going to relax the standards not just for the city, um, but for industries along the side of the creek." And he said, "Look, if you're going to do that, you need to make them make sure that they're doing testing that's a little bit more extensive, actually significantly more extensive than what they're doing, to make sure that the water." that's running off their property and going into the creek is in itself quite polluted. Mm -hmm. And so the regional board is saying, well, we are going to change this equation. We are going to save the money hundreds of millions, of, uh, save the city, excuse me, mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, but we do want to put this new, uh, potentially put this new testing burden on these industries mm -hmm. uh, along the creek and in the watershed, which is about 25 <coughs> square miles. And how the environmentalists feel about that? I mean, it doesn't sound like they're terribly militant at this point. They're just raising legitimate concerns. Yeah, they uh, don't debate that the metals limit needs to change. They debate how much it needs to change. Uh, there's been some dispute whether the, sitting, the city has done um, enough testing to justify the change that they want to make. Mm -hmm. But pretty much everybody agrees um, that the original equation to calculate this metals limit um, was not based on science that we now have mm -hmm. a decade or two later. Are the environmentalists embracing the uh, the scientific report we've got more more recently from the, the cities? Um, they, uh, they've looked at it in different ways. There's been some peer review of it, um, and they have a, a slightly different interpretation. They would rather that you take the lowest number 
um, for the metals limit, and the city is taking an average of several numbers mm -hmm. uh, to make it kind of complicated. To make it higher. Mm -hmm. To make it yeah. higher, yes, that <laughs> brings it up. So instead of instead of a four being your limit, they would have a, a set, the city wants a seven, environmentalists would want a four. All right, Andy, we're ever gonna have anything done on this, or is this one that's easy enough to punt? Yeah, I, <clears> I mean, I think you can see the city's approach is, is pretty, pretty clear how they'd like this to work out. I think um, one of the responses I, th I thought that was pretty fair and, and uh, you know something I'd like to see the city grapple with is how this would play out if Choice Creek didn't run in fact through Barrio Logan, Encanto, uh, Southeast San Diego City Heights and lower income places like uh, like Lemon Grove um, and if it instead ran through say La Jolla out into Carmel Valley um, would, would, would this still be the approach that we yeah. deal with? <clears throat> so there's that aspect of, of politics. Yeah, so I, I do think it's a pretty interesting environmental right. justice case. Well, I'm sure we'll keep following up as you guys do more reporting on what happens certainly in that February vote. Well, that, we are out of time. That does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Andrew Keats of Voice of San Diego, and uh, James DeHaven of the San Diego Union Tribune, and Ryra Bard also of Voice of San Diego. A reminder, all the stories that uh, we uh, talked about today are available on our, on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable. <laughs>